I'm going to do the short version of Jason's bio because right now my office is like crazy. Um, but um, I'm to to our participants. I just uh, would like to say that he's one of the nicest and kindest people I know and one of the best musicians out there. Um, he's originally from Trinidad, uh, Trinidad and Tobago. He received his um, BA from, in piano from Oakwood College, now Oakwood University, where he works, um, and the Master of Arts from Morgan State University. Is that an HBC school as well? Yes. yes. And then um, he studied um, at the University of Maryland with um, Edward McClary, who um, was also a protege of Robert Schoen. Um, the, the credits are huge on here, but I want to make sure we get time to do the thing that we're all here to do, which is to learn a little more about uh, programming in perilous times. Um, but I would say that um, he has uh, three kids now, uh, lives in Huntsville, Alabama. Um, and if you were at ACDA in uh, Kansas City and heard the ensemble once, twice, or three times, like some of us did, um, it was a stunning performance. So uh, welcome uh, to uh, Jason, and uh, I'm looking forward to our time together. I am too, and thank you so much for having me. Um, um, it's a little intimidating following all the wonderful guests you've had over the last month or so, but thank you so much. I'm humbled. Well, we're just pleased to have you here, and we're looking forward to seeing you here in, in October, hopefully, as well, right. back at SC. Right. So, Jason, um, I'm sure there are lots of questions that are going to pop up. Um, and I'd like you to maybe talk, because I think the first thing to ask you is, um, how did you program that program at ACDA? What went through your mind? What were the steps? And what would you want people to think about when they're programming? Not no, necessarily- start here. I think- I think it's of utmost importance for, for me as a conductor to start um, each musical journey with a clear mind and a clear thought. And um, sometimes we simply have to take a step back and intentionally create an environment where we can be poured into, right? Um, this may mean something as simple as, um, I don't know, going to the beach or taking a, a a bike ride or visiting a friend, um, some, something that could really inspire us. And, and, and this quarantine time is kind of helping at least me in one aspect because the time is a little quiet and I could really think. So whatever your, your method is, I think we need to find somewhere to start from a clean musical palette. And, um, and then the, the other thing that's always at the forefront of my mind is not so much to present a concert, but to present an experience. Um, one of my dear friends, Laurie Lubzinger, um, um, one of the, the redheads, as I call her from Ohio, Laurie and Kim, they came to a concert we did a few years ago, and, and Laurie was the one who came to me and said, you know, Jason, you create an experience. And unbeknownst to them, I took a considerable amount of time just to chew upon that concept. And what was probably a subconscious product, I was now and still very determined to make that a very intentional process. So, so for me, I, I, would, I want to posit five considerations that, that, that I make when I program any concert. And I know we're talking about the ACDA program. So the five things I had in my mind were these, diversity of audience. Um, I have this term I coined, you know, mix it up. That was the second thing. The third thing I, I like to do is, uh, you know, just look at the order of program um, and then theme slash running thread and then global representation. And then I always consider my singers, the voices, stamina, that kind of thing. And then the next thing is staging. I take those big picture things and I start from there. And I'm sure with the questions, I could kind of break those down some more. Well, so, I mean, it was an event. I mean, I, I think we all felt that in, in the performance and, and you got that back from the audience because it was, it was diverse. It certainly showed the flexibility of your ensemble. Um, and I'm wondering, you know, there are times in my 
my teaching where I may use something from a year prior and put it into a program because it fits well. Yeah. Did you, was any of this music, did you start it all in that particular semester or did you, or that particular year or were there some things maybe that you yeah. did once or twice before? There, there were a couple pieces in there that we did from the year before. Um, one of them being the closing piece, The Promised Land, uh, which was written by yeah. my friend Ken Burton. And um, that piece just seemed to culminate exactly what we were trying to say throughout the program. And, and it called for all the forces, all the forces meaning, you know, double core and all the instrumentation. So, so um, that piece in particular was one we did from the year before. Yes. Okay. What about, so what was, if we were to put a theme together for that concert, you have a 25 minute set, it has to be within the 25 minute, as we all know, if we've done anything with ACDA. Uh, and it's tough. It's really, really hard. Um, I have never labored over a program as I did for, for the ACDA program. Um, and, and, you know, the order changed seemed daily. And um, one, one of the key things for me that works, and, you know, it could work for other people too, you know, years past, I would sit alone and try to come up with everything. Now I kind of surround myself with at least two or three guys and we really bounce ideas back and forth and literally argue at times. Like, you know, <laughs> do, you think, do you think this is really going to work? Are you serious? And I'll sleep on it. And I come back the next day and say, you know what? That might work. And, um, but it's always that great feeling of, you know what? I think this is it. And, you know, come hell or high water, this is what we're going to do. And, and, you know, we, we kind of plan from there and move forward. But, um, the time thing was a big consideration. It was definitely a hard process. How often does your group meet? We meet three times a week. Um, so six hours total, two on Tuesday, two on Thursday. And if we are not on the road traveling, we meet on Friday as well for two more hours. So six hours, uh, give or take. Okay. And are your students, I mean, when you're talking, you talked about one of the tenants being your singers. Are your singers all music majors? They are not. Um, years ago at Oakwood, there was one year I remember the days when we would have, you know, as, as many as 70% of the group that were non-music majors. The tide has kind of flipped a little bit, so it's probably a little higher in percentage with music majors slash minors, but my kids are from all over campus, which, which for me is exhilarating. Um, we have a lot of science majors that sing really, really well, math majors, so I love that combination because each of them think music in a different way. And that's, that's beautiful to me. That's great. I have a question here. Um, this is uh, posed. Your uh, performance in Kansas City with the Aeolians was exquisite, especially, particularly the Bach. Um, can you talk about staging the interspersing of instrumentalists? Also, how did you approach the Bach? You made it leap off the page and gave it new life and effectively became viral at the conference and in the industry? Wow, great question. Um, okay, L let me, this is a webinar, so let me break this down, maybe in a slightly longer way. I'll take the second question first, Bach. So people don't believe this when I say, say this, stuff. that was the first time my choir even attempted any Bach, seriously. <laughs> um, but that all came within my whole mix it up approach. We had to do something of that nature and that magnitude and from that genre. And I think where I started from, and this may seem a little abstract, but you know, I'm from Trinidad and Tobago, as, as you could probably pick up from my accent, right? <laughs> so embedded in my bones is a very rhythmic music of calypso and soca and reggae and dance hall and, and steel pan and all those things. And from a very young age, my friends and I started experimenting with um, like instrumental jazz and vocal jazz and gospel music. I'm, I'm going somewhere with this. So, so in my, in my life growing up, I was either culturally exposed or exposed by virtue of taking piano lessons and or, or exposed by virtue of just being curious with my friends. So, so for me, I, I pride myself in not being an expert in many different genres, but I'm familiar with many different genres. Okay, so we presented the Bach. So what we did was we actually thought about it as being jazz. So, so we, we listened to a lot of jazz pieces about the same tempo we wanted to take, to take the Bach and we try to get the feel of that music. So it will have that lift, it will have that energy. 
um, and have that rhythmic drive and buoyancy. And that, for my singers, they could easily identify with that, and that helped a whole, whole lot. And, um, and that's the thing I have about, I call it cross fertilization of styles. Again, we can be an expert in everything, but I think learning different things from different styles can help us really fuse and cross fertilize, as I like to call it, so that we can take elements that can help something else. So for us and Bach, that really, really helped. And of course, I had the, the help of uh, my dear teacher at University of Maryland who flew down and, and really worked with us on the old Baroque stylings and Bruce Rogers. So for Bach, that's what worked for us, a lot of jazz. Uh, the staging thing, it was really no science behind that. For us, we wanted to just do something different. And we were like, you know, who says the instruments have to be in front of us? Let's put them all in between. And for something like the Bach, where essentially everybody's just doubling, it really kind of helped. And um, if you're gonna try, just, just, just be prepared. Some instrumental, instrumentalists will not love you at first. <laughs> Uh, because the day before we performed, we rehearsed at a church, and of course the church stage didn't allow us to do what we did for the concert. So after the rehearsal, I gave them a, a picture of the stage plot, and they're like, what is this? This, this is not going to work. Are you serious? I said, just trust me. I think it worked. But after the concert, though, they, the, all the players were like, man, this was the most beautiful thing. We could hear all the parts. We felt like we were in the ensemble and not necessarily out front. So that, that was our rationale with the staging. It wasn't anything too deep. I'm embarrassed at how simple that really was. <laughs> yeah. To the, to the audience members, we have a chat, uh, excuse me, a question and answer uh, uh, file here. If you want to add in any questions, um, we're monitoring that. Um, so if you just want to take a look and ans ask any questions. Um, let's, let's move on. Your singers in Bach. When did you start the Bach, and how long do you think it really took for them to get it in the voice? So, excellent question. We started the, the Bach right at the beginning of the semester. So this would have been, you know, third week in August of 2018. And, um, you know, so, sometimes I like to have my singers dive, dive in deep and start with, with this piece. I wanted to kind of go slow and make sure that no muscle memory things kicked in. So we count, we count sang for months, from August all the way to November, I believe. No text, just count singing, um, really making sure the intervals were in the air, you know, um, making sure all the endings were nice and clean. Um, we sang the piece for the first time, I wanna say in December with text, but I don't think the piece was really, really in the voice. You, you know, Mike, I would say like two weeks before ACDA. Honestly, that's when it started like, like cooking. Um, before that, it was just mechanics, it felt like. And, um, but two weeks before, we found that tempo that really worked for us. And, and it just started doing, doing something really nice and special. So I would say two weeks before the concert really, really got into the voice and, and probably more importantly, into their hearts. That's great. Yeah. Um, did you change anything between your three um, venue um, sites? Um, you know, uh, what, for instance, uh, you know, you had the church, but then you had the dry hall and you had the good hall. Exactly. And, and I heard you in, in, you know, all three. What, would, what did you tell your singers? We would like to have been a fly on the, on the wall as you were working in each one of those dress rehearsals in those spaces. You know, um, I remember, Mike, years ago, in, uh, it was a national conference in Dallas, and Jerry McCoy did a session. I, I don't remember the title of his session, but I do remember there was one point he made, and I understood what he was saying at the time, but I didn't have any context. He, he was talking about tuning to a different hall. Yeah. Like, what is he talking about? But years and years later, that, that makes so much sense to me now. Um, the church was no problem at all. I mean, it, it's very reverberant. Um, I think the spiritual we sang for the sacred music concert, we probably uh, slowed the tempo down a few, and that's Marcus Garrett's piece. I believe Marcus may be on this 
webinar. So <laughs> we, we probably pulled the tempo back a, a, a smidge so that so that you know the room when kind of do too much of, of the reverb thing. The big concert hall was an absolute joy to sing in. It it seemed perfect for voices. Um, the only thing I noticed though was that the the lower frequencies at least from where I was standing, it wasn't as much as I like. And I kind of like, you know, this, this uh, yeah. sound bass. So my, I like bass. So my bass just had to kind of really, really dig in and kind of, and kind of sing out there. Now the, the theater hall was tough. Um, you heard nothing like the singers couldn't hear themselves really. And um, so they had to really rely on what they know and don't change the game plan. We talk about that a whole lot. Stick with the game plan. Don't over sing, don't under sing. If, if there's something I need, I will call for it through my conducting. But the three rooms were vastly different, but, but my singers are pretty good at shifting gears because we do so many concerts during the year at different venues. And sometimes you don't have a lot of, um, you know, dress rehearsal time. So one, the church was really, really easy. We, you know, basically sang itself. The concert hall was great. My bassist probably had to make the, the most adjustment. And in the dry hall where you really couldn't hear, we just really had to stick with our game plan. And, and Mike, let me just throw this in too. The room we're rehearsing at Oakwood is pretty dry. So that, that probably worked in our favor too. So, so they're kind of pretty, you know, pretty used to that sound. Yeah, it's a low ceiling, isn't it, at Oakwood? Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Um, I've got some questions here in the in the room. Um, could you speak in more detail about finding that clean slate in your programming process? How clean is it? Do you literally spend time not listening to music, or is it a more a mental state or an intention? Also, what role does inspiration pay, play in your programming? Wow, that's that's a that's a very 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 deep question. Um, for me, sometimes going into big projects, yes, sometimes I will only listen to one genre or listen to nothing at all. Um, they, that might seem very, very strange, but for me, I just have to kind of get the noise out of, out of my head at times. Um, so, so clean, meaning clean, clean. Um, and then really, really trying to take hold of what's happening around me. Like, like, like for example, this pandemic is an awful thing, but it, it excites me in terms of what we may be hearing after the pandemic. Like I, I am just waiting to hear what conductors are gonna come up with in terms of what will be said now after all this turmoil. Um, you know, we, we can't just program surface level anymore. I think we have to think very, very, very deeply because people are gonna be in pain. Um, people have lost loved ones, people have, you know, losing money back and forth. So clean slate. And then, um, and then I really try to, how should I say this? It was the Jubilee year of ACDA, right? So I, I sat for a little while and thought about, you know, what can we say? What can we represent? What do we want to say in such a significant year for such a huge organization? So those questions I started asking myself, and hopefully I can slowly come up with answers either within myself or asking others, you know? Um, I think reaching out to people is, is key. Um, people like Mike, I mean, Mike, I, 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 I hit you up a lot about, you know, should I do this, should I do that, and different people. So just trying to get a sense and a feel of what's happening around you, what's happening in the society, clear my mind, and then I go. We have about five or six questions here, so I'm going to go through them. This one is, every year, I assume, you get new repertoire and new singers. Where do you start in getting new, chorally inexperienced singers to understand and assimilate the techniques of choral singing? Awesome question. Um, you know, I think that's something we strive for every day in all our rehearsals. Um, technique, 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 passion, passion, passion. And then every conductor has their their things that they like to do. And I, and I call that part your system. Um, I approach my choir as like we're a basketball team. So, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting looking at uh, uh, the Michael Jordan documentary. I mean, you, you didn't play for Phil Jackson if you didn't believe in the triangle offense, right? You just won't play for the Bulls or the Lakers. So 
the aliens have certain things that we do that, that, that we have developed over the years. And once they come into the system, I find year by year, they learn it quickly because the system is in place and we just kind of pass it along. Um, but, you know, I collaborate with my voice teachers a lot. I bring them in at least once very early into the, into the year. So the, the new people could have some voice lessons happening either, uh, by themselves in a smaller setting, smaller class. And every year we always designate someone within the group of voice major to be a vocal technician, we call them. So they'll pull people aside or make themselves available. Hey, you know, Friday, one to four, I'll be in the practice room and any new person that wants to come in, feel free to come in. And that, and that really helps. So for the voice student, they, they get experience teaching and the new people are getting lessons and techniques. So that's something we do to try and you know, bring them quickly along in terms of technique and choral singing and that sort of thing. Very good. Here's the next question. As an in aspiring choral music educator, do acoustics of the room you will perform uh, in affect the repertoire in your, in your uh, repertoire selections for a concert? It, it sounds that because you're moving so much, in various acoustics that maybe it doesn't, maybe it, do you have a good hall at home to sing in? We, we do. When we perform on campus, we use the university church and um, it, it's, it's kind of a blend of electronic and acoustic. So we, we, we navigate that as well. But yeah, but for example, AC Day was a specialized type of program. So three of us, uh, my, uh, my associate conductor, our manager, we actually flew up to Kansas City a few months before to see the space. And, you know, you go in and you clap and you kind of hear the reverb of the room. So that, that influenced choice, my choice in repertoire. Definitely. That's, that's, that's always a consideration. Now, when we do our concerts throughout the nation, you know, sometimes you can't always do that. You just have to kind of guess or make the adjustments when you get there. But if I'm programming for specific events or specific conference, definitely that comes into play. Yes. Okay. Here's one. Um, how do you go about dealing with your doubts of your own ideas? What gives you the assurance, especially when people think you're crazy? Wow, that is a wonderful question. I'll answer this way, I'll flip it around. I, I often talk about, as conductors, we have to have um, no fear in what we think is right. L let me explain it this way. You know, sometimes you go to concerts and I feel like some con some conductors just program things because they heard someone else do it, as opposed to doing something new uh, and, and, and being fearless in, wow, I've never heard anyone do this, but I'm going to do it anyway. And I think, I think we need more of that daredevil mentality when it comes to um, <laughs> programming. Um, um, I, I like to find new things, things that have not been done. If I do something old that I've heard someone else do it, I want to do it for a reason. I want to do it because it's going to teach my singers X, Y, or Z. Um, but I like finding the new things because it's inspirational, it's fresh in my ears. And I just reach the, I get to a point where I have no fear. I like it. I believe it has a message. And that's the next thing as, con as conductors. We just have to realize that everyone will never like all that we do. <laughs> and once, <laughs> once, once you come to that realization, there's, a, there's no burdens, no burdens at all. So by the time we got to ACDA, we liked what we programmed. We believed in what we programmed. And we just want to sh we wanted to share it. And, you, and, you, and hopefully you saw all the emotion behind it, whether it was joy or, or something contemplative. But at that point, you know, so no fear, no fear. So that's how I get over my doubts. Just, <laughs> just you know. Here's one. Um, what is your approach to sight reading for the Aeolians? For example, how much do you do and what techniques do you use? Um, let me answer that question this way. We, my colleagues in the department, we work as a team to, to, to hit that concept because, you know, in your rehearsal, when you have so much, so much time. So my, my theory teacher happens to be the assistant conductor for the aliens. So he embeds within his theory classes all the time, uh, sight singing, sight singing, sight singing. Um, and then we use time within our rehearsals as well, you know, in the beginning or something in between where we build in that skill all along the way. Because as I shared, a lot of my singers are not music majors. So sometimes 
that skill is you know, lowest on, on their tool belt. So thankfully I have a team in place, theory teachers that help me along, along with that. Uh, here's a, a question from New Zealand. Um, uh, as you've mentioned, these unusual times have given us all an opportunity to slow down and evaluate the various methodologies and reason behind our craft. Just wondering if you've reached any conclusions yet, what aspects have you decided are valuable and what have you decided is actually not important? Oh, that is an excellent question. Um, the first part, let me answer like this. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm really contemplating this, this topic, um, pragmatic programming for perilous times. But honestly, I'm kind of taking my time on figuring out what that all means. Um, you know, I look at the news every day and you see these numbers going up. I think we had 60,000 now. But I, I, I know when we get to the end of this, I will have to really, really figure out, um, you know, what do people need to hear in these concerts? Um, what can we just do without? Um, what's important for me in this, in this time? Um, family, um, connectivity, um, you know, staying, staying sane. And I mean that in a serious way and in a playful way, like staying sane and, and keeping my mental acuity um, at, at its highest. But, um, you know, person from New Zealand, like I think, I think this time we just still all using to figure it, figure it out. Um, I don't know what's, what's going to happen in, in August, September. Will we have a choir to even rehearse? Um, and if we do, um, you know, do we just program frivol frivolously? We have to really be intentional now and, and make the best use of time. So. I, I didn't answer that question. I responded, but <laughs> hopefully the person will understand where I'm coming from. Um, this is a, a good one. In light of social distancing being a possible, possible new normal for us, how do you think choral music will evolve as an art form? Will it be virtual, all virtual, or will ensembles space out or something other? Man, I, I don't have an answer for that question. I've been talking to close friends and and, and colleagues and my wife, um, you know, I, I don't know. Um, I mean, I would love for it to remain as is, you know, the big part of being a choral community is that we can reach out and touch and I could sit 60 people in front of me and touch them and, and listen to them and see their faces and look into their eyes. Um, choral music and music making is just not the same virtually. Um, I don't care how, you know, who figures out the whole latency thing and the delay. I don't care if they figure it out, it's just absolutely not the same thing. And honestly, that's the main reason I choose, chose to be a choral musician. I know I did piano for undergrad, but I realized very quickly, I didn't want to be a concert pianist. I'm in a room by myself for all these hours and I can't touch people. So I chose this field because of that community thing. So I don't know, I'm, I'm, I'm fearful worried just like anyone else in my field and um you know i'm just praying that that we can have some at least some return to normalcy in, in the fall and going forward here's here's one about the aeolians how many concerts do you typically give in a year do you approach annual programming with a long-range plan for example do you consider the last concert and yes you plan with regards to developing skills sound difficulty etc when you're setting out the first program of the year yeah, good question. Um, I don't know if I have a number in my head. I, 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 could, I could divide it like this. In the fall semester, you know, everyone is just starting from scratch. You have a new choir, a new member. So we typically don't do too many concerts between August and say the, the week right before Thanksgiving. The, the weekend right before Thanksgiving, we typically take our first trip. So it may be a weekend trip, Friday night concert, Saturday concert, and a Sunday concert. Um, and then that'll be it for the semester. We do our end of semester concert, first week of December, and then that's it. Second semester is when we really hit the road. You know, Oakwood is an HBCU, a historically black college and university. So once January hits, we have all our Martin Luther King um, singing to do, and you hit February, that's, uh, you know, Black History Month. So typically between January and say the end of March, we probably will leave campus like twice a month. 
twice a month on a, on a trip. So, you know, those are like Friday night, Saturday, Sunday concerts, give or take. Sometimes we don't do the Sunday, just depending on what's going on. So I don't really have an exact number of how many concerts we do. We, we do quite a bit. Um, do I start programming the, for the full year? Yes and no. Sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. Um, ACDA came in February. So obviously I was, you know, looking at that from the summertime. Sometimes I have a stack of music that I, I, I think I want to do. And I literally will, will kind of listen to the group for about the first two weeks. And then my thoughts are kind of chiseled even more. So, ah, you know what? This year, this group is going to be good at this. Or maybe they are not good at this and they need to learn this. <laughs> so it kind of varies. You know, I, 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 I want to mix up things I think they will do naturally well combined with things that they just need to learn skill-wise and, 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 to, and to up their game and ante in a lot of different genres. So, so yes or no, it's a mixed bag. Talking off that same stream, um, so when selecting um, repertoire for a festival, do you, um, do you like to keep pieces with, con uh, like pieces with contrasting themes or stories or keep them all consistent to one theme? Uh, you know, you, you could you could slice that different ways. Um, sometimes I start things with a clear theme in mind and just and just develop that theme as I go. Sometimes themes evolve for us. And honestly, the ACDA program was one, it kind of evolved and the theme kind of showed itself um, later on. Um, I don't consider myself a theme expert. Um, Eric Nelson, who's at Emory University, I mean, Eric is a genius. genius at that, yeah. I, um, matter of fact, maybe a month and a half ago, we were in Atlanta recording, and one of the instrumentalists was like, hey, Eric has this concert tonight. You guys should come. So a few of us went. And this concert that night was, uh, I forget what he called it, but basically all the songs in this concert asked a question. I'm like, that is genius. And it was a <laughs> genius program. And maybe two years ago, um, Eric Nelson came to work with the aliens and we sang something and it triggered something in his mind right then. He said, you know what, Jason, next year I'm going to do a program called, um, he called it double take. So he did two settings of the same text throughout the concert, which again is like genius. I mean, who does that? So, I mean, if you, if you great on your mind, things like that, go for it. Um, my mind doesn't start the initially. But sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. But, you know, I, I go back and forth. But sometimes a, an evolving theme could be just as exciting. And it, it sounds like there's another question that kind of piggybacks on that. How much does text bear on programming, especially in times we are in? Does program flow, does the program flow in terms of keys? Do you worry about keys when you're programming? Yes, yes, definitely. Um, I'm a big proponent of, okay, what key am I coming from? What key am I going to? And I think that was obvious in our ACDA program. You know, we, we did one of those programs where we just kind of went from song to song to song without a stop per se, just a tacker. So we had to really learn, okay, this is coming from here. We need to get to here. And we had to rehearse, rehearse all those transitions. And, and then sometimes subconsciously a concert goer is not, you know, keenly aware of, all the things that make them feel a certain way. We as musicians know it. We know, for example, we know E major is a nice bright key. We know this key is gonna make me feel dark and sad. We know how a minor key makes us feel as opposed to a major key. So we know all those things. And I think it's critical that we, as the uh, curator of a program, we take all of those elements and try and create that experience so that, you know, they're not just sitting there, you know, we have to create those things that, um, that create that motion and create feeling. I mean, you know, one thing I wish we could do live, I'm still, I'm still trying to figure this out, how I can change frequency with voices. <laughs> a whole other topic. You know, my friends like Jacob Collier will record certain songs on a totally different frequency and on different frequencies make you feel and hear things in a different way. So I'm still trying to figure that out. Maybe the next ACDA program will do that. <laughs> Here, here's a question from Atlanta. Um, how do you feel about the idea of creating a theatrical type of experience, the inclusion of video or lighting system to assist in creating the next level concert experience? I'm all for it as long as it doesn't distract. As long as it doesn't get in the way of the music. Um, you know, sometimes I see things, it just, it just seems like way too much. 
But um, if you can do it very, very tastefully and to enhance the music, by all means, go ahead. The same way I feel about staging, you know? The staging must complement the music. Um, so if you're gonna use video screens and other theatrical things, you know, do it, but as long as it doesn't get into, in, in the way. All right. Um, here's one that I can relate to. Uh, is, is performing a new piece from a composer while said composer is in the audience nerve wracking? Uh, it can be depending on the circumstance. Let, let me explain. Um, another thing I like to talk about for programming, you know, it, it's always a, a good thing when you can, if you could have that element of um, collaboration with a composer and, and especially for someone you know well, I know Mike, you do this all the time. So for us, in one example, for us in our AC Day program, we did an arrangement of Smile by uh, Dr. Cedric Dent, kind of vocal jazz setting. Cedric um, was one of the founding members of the group Take Six that have, you know, they've won like 10, 11 Grammys. And it was cool to be able to pick up the phone and call Cedric and say, hey, we, we want to do it this way or this tempo. And then, and then the added element of him actually coming and singing the solo himself. You know, he wasn't thinking of singing. I just invited him. So in that case, he's there with us. I'm not nervous at all because he's been part of the process and the kids are all used to him. Sometimes, um, you know, sometimes I compose this in the audience and I didn't realize it till after, which, which, which is great. So I'm not nervous at all. But having the person there, you know, would you be nervous? I guess that depends on, on you, the person, right? Um, I don't think I will be nervous. Uh, I will, this, this is how it makes me feel. It'll make me feel like I really need to guard the gift of his piece or her piece a little more. That's all it does to me. And, and I'm probably a little more caring with the piece if the person is in the audience. Okay, here's a question that's, uh, I think, a, a yes or no one. Okay. Um, have the Aeolians been invited to perform at the opening concert of the 2021 ACDA National Conference in Dallas, Texas? No. <laughs> okay, so that was easy to do. Um, here we go. Um, what is your audition process? Do you have callbacks? Do you, how do you run those? Are the Aeolians all undergraduate singers or a mix of undergrad and grand? Uh, grads such as USC chamber singers? The Aeolians are all undergrads, uh, one. Um, most years we do have a callback process. So um, if I'm trying to get a group of 50 people, we'll probably have callbacks of 60 people. And then we kind of listen to balance and blend and that sort of thing. My audition process is, is you know pretty simple. It takes about 10 minutes or less. Um, the student walks in the door, my theory teacher, who I mentioned earlier, he, he, he draws up a simple test of, you know, simple theory things, notes, keys, you know, identify those things. They finish that very quickly. Then they come to myself or associate director of choral activities and I take them through some scales, um, listen to the range. Then they come with a prepared piece. Um, it could be anything they, they want to sing, uh, any style. Um, and then the last piece is, is sight singing. And, and that's it. So those, those, those components take up the short audition. Here's one which I can relate to and I think every conductor in the room can. Um, just thinking about a year, I had 14 seniors graduating. How do you deal with student turnover as it relates to music you choose? Do you have to modify the levels of music that you choose for constant evolving levels of the students? Uh, yes, y yes. Um, I'm one of those guys, I love turnover years for some reason. Like, um, it's kind of like, again, going back to basketball. I love basketball. You know, some teams, you have those rebuilding years, we call them. <laughs> and I love rebuilding years because, I don't know about you, Mike, but sometimes I get to a point within a season, within a school year, and I'm saying to myself, you know what, next year I'm going to not teach this technique or approach this thing a certain way. And sometimes it's not even things musical, it's just the way I run the choir or the way I engender certain habits. And I'm, and I'm excitedly waiting for the next year when I could start this new initiative. You know what I mean? So I, I, I look at rebuilding years as gifts. Um, you get to start afresh and, and try a new thing and new philosophies and new teachings. How does that affect my repertoire? Um, you know. If you, have a, if you don't have a rebuilding year, obviously you have a group of returning students that are just ready to go and you could start at a, at, at a higher level, whatever higher level means to you. Um, 
harder music, more challenging music. You know, rebuilding here, you have to kind of take those baby steps and, and really build it back up. So, you know, it, it, it happens different ways, but that's how I approach it. Um, this is about music majors and non-majors. You yeah. have mentioned that you have a mixture of majors and minors yeah. and non-music majors in the Aeolians. Are members of the Aeolians allowed to participate in gospel choir or any other ensembles? <laughs> I would love to know who asked that question. <laughs> well, I'm allowed. I, I don't want to give his name away. <laughs> I'm, I'm tickled because um, let's take the group Take Six that I just mentioned, right? In in the 70s, the, the Aeolian had a director by the name of uh, Dr. Alma Blackman, who was legendary. She's a legendary figure here at Oakwood. And she had a rule that if you were in the Aeolians, you could not sing in a group uh, 10 or less or something like that. So take six, <laughs> some of the guys in take six were in the Aeolians and they had to kind of sneak around for a while, you know, and do their thing. Or eventually they kind of just, you know, went into take six full time. So it used to be a hard and fast rule that if you in the Aeolians, you couldn't sing in another ensemble. I don't have that rule per se, but I think just by virtue of the workload and the commitment level of the Aeolians, I don't think they realize on their own that they probably couldn't do both anyway. Um, so I don't really have to preach that too much. I think, I think everyone kind of realizes that now. And, um, and you know, we, we got to preserve the vocal goal. So no, we don't see them singing in other gospel choirs that much. They may, they may sing on our praise team every now and then at the youth, you know, they have the youth meetings here at Oakwood, but uh, no. So I don't have the rule in writing, but it's kind of understood. <laughs> Have you considered adding African music into your repertoire? Would, I've, I've totally considered it. Um, that's something I've been kind of trying to learn more of in, in recent years. And a couple of years ago, when we went to South Africa, we totally loved the music. I mean, you, you would go to church and they would break out in these hymns with that African harmony and African rhythms and stuff. We, we loved it. So, so yes, we haven't done a whole lot of, of that yet, but it's, it's coming. It's coming. Um, what are some of those things in the Aeolian's system that you can share those techniques that might be unique to your choral culture? Okay. Um, the first thing is this, which is a non-musical thing. We work really hard at, you know, trying to make it a family. You know, not everyone will be best friends, but in my groups, it's important for me that everyone is at some level of collegiality because I've learned that if that's not right um, simple things like well it's not simple tuning will never be all the way right if members are just like this and there, and there's some years where um, the tuning has just been impeccably good and they get along like the group I had this year you know never had any issues serious issues with tuning another thing we like to talk about is um, um, being relentless. Um, that's something we, we do too. We, we spend a lot of time in our focusing moments, um, either reading a book or someone is reading a book and they'll come and share aspects of that book. And it's so funny on, on the Michael Jordan documentary, they had a snippet of a guy named, uh, his name is Tim Grover, who's written a book called Relentless. Tim Grover was a guy responsible for, for bulking up Michael Jordan. He was his trainer. He was a trainer for Dwayne Way, trainer for Kobe Bryant. And in 2017, the month before we went to the world, choir of the world competition, we had everyone in the choir reading that book. Oh my gosh, it made a huge difference in just how we approach things. So that's another thing we do. Um, there's some musical things that, that we kind of... Uh, talk about a lot. We talk about orchestration a lot. So approaching the choir like it's an orchestra. So that, that gives us a lot of um, differentiation and colors and timbres and, you know, sing this like a French horn, sing this like a string section or this section is brass. You know, so those things, I mean, nothing new, monumental, but it works for us. Um, we, we have a unique system. You know, again, it works for us when it comes to dynamics. Um, a few years ago, it just slapped me in the face in the middle of rehearsal. Like, like I asked my singers, you know, what does what does forte really mean? And of course, they gave me the definition. But but I could go down the street with another choir and say, sing this forte, and the level could be different, right? It could be louder or softer, depending on how you did it. 
So we, we just use our numbering system now for dynamics. Um, I think now the, the present group, one being our softest dynamic, going all the way to 16, I think we got to now. So immediately that gives me so many more increments of dynamics as opposed to pianissimo, piano. You know, I think that only gives me like what, eight or something like that. So that's something that we use a lot. So in everybody's scores, you just see all these numbers written in as opposed to dynamics, you know, P, the Italian term. So that's something we do. So those are a few things, you know, I don't want to give away all our secrets. <laughs> no, <laughs> I'm, I'm an open book, but um, those are some things that, that we hold true. Okay, we have um, another one here, which is, what's your take on proper choir tuning? My take on qu proper choir tuning. Um, that's, that's such a, a deep question. And it, it differs from me sometimes on if I'm singing with instruments or not. So, I mean, we all know the piano is not equally tuned, right? So, but then we have to do songs with piano. We have to do songs with different instruments. So that takes a different type of listening. When we go to a cappella singing now, we have that opportunity to really try and tune to the sense, right? You know, every note has a hundred cents and you could kind of, you know, push it sharp, push it <laughs> lower. It's still the same note, but it, different shades of the note. And um, I think it's just the ability for the, for the group to really, uh, really find out what side of that spectrum they want to be. Because again, depending on what side of the spectrum you want to be in tuning, it'll, it gives a different feeling, a different vibe, and it hits your heart in a different way. And, and for us, Mike, um, Again, I'm talking about cross-fertilization this whole time. My dear friend, and we, we call each other brothers now, Jacob Collier, uh, a year ago or so, we did a, re a day of recording with Jacob. And let me tell you something. That was the best lesson in tuning I've had in my entire life. I mean, it's one thing for, for someone to say, you know, that note is a little flat or is on the lower side of the note. But for someone to sing it back for you and you could actually hear it, it was like mind-boggling. So cross fertilization, Jacob does, you know, every form of music, you know, but his ability to hear and how he hears the tuning and, 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 and how he can hear, okay, pushing this E up in the score on the sharper side is going to make this thing buzz and reverberate is a totally different feeling. So, you know, again, I'm probably responding to the question, not answering it because you have so many different schools of thought when it comes to tuning, but um, I'm a stickler in tuning. It has to be, it has to be dead on. Um, here's, I think, a short one. We'll see. Um, what do you use to provide the starting pitch to an a cappella composition? Tuning fork, pitch pipe, or piano? Based on this, why do you use that particular method? Great question. You know, for most of my life, I, I never even thought about really the differences between those. But, but based on the answer I just gave, if I'm doing something a cappella, I probably want to take it from a pitch fork. Because that piano sometimes is not true. Um, pitchfork, pitchfork, um, definitely. Um, what was this last part of that question? And based on my answer, what? Ah, uh, and uh, why do you choose that particular method? I think was the end of uh, it. Yeah, yeah, so, so, time. yeah. So the pitchfork I'll use for the acapella things because it, it, it just gives me a pure 440 where I want to be. Sometimes the piano differs a lot. And um, In Los you know, Angeles, it's 443 for an A. Are you serious? No, oh, the, wow. the, the uh, LA Phil. Yeah. Ah, gotcha. Yeah. Here, here's one. Um, you've talked about developing themes or evolving themes over a program cycle. Do you have a process for involving or engaging your singers with those themes you choose? If so, are there any extra mi uh, musical elements to this? And how does it affect the rehearsal process? Wow, great question. Um, let me answer this way. Sometimes I'll have the material at hand. And like I said, we talk about the music a lot. Like, like, what do you see with this text? And then at that point, you kind of let it to the singers to develop what they want to get out of the material. And then at the end of the process, the audience is going to get what we developed in that program. So, um, you know, a student may come and say, you know, for me, this song means it brings so much comfort because I don't know, I lost my mom's X amount of years ago and it makes me feel safe or wh whatever it is. And we talk about it. And I think it's crucial for choirs to really be clear on what the message is in, in a given song. I'll even bring the, break that down further. 
Quires need to be clear on what's being said in a given phrase. <laughs> we spent a lot of time on that. And let, let, me just, let me just pause it for a little while, Mike, because I think this is crucial. I think there's a difference between learning a program and then I think it's a totally different process now to, to perfect that program or to bring it up the page. Learning the program just means to me I'm able to sing from the first note to the last note. The next part of the process is what do we put in it to make this thing very impactful? Let me give you a great example. We stumbled upon this two years ago. I'm in South Africa, World Choir Games, and we needed a place to rehearse. So we go to the hotel and we say, hey, do you guys have a room where we can rehearse? They said, sure. They took us upstairs and it was this wonderful dance studio that had mirrors all around the room. That right there changed our lives because all of a sudden we can see everyone's face. We can see everyone's body language. So now that's something we implement. I'm getting ready for ACDA. For the month before ACDA, we found a dance studio with mirrors. So we could see everyone, we could see faces, and we could really, really connect with, with, with what we're trying to say. So um, that's something, again, that, that, that works for us. So learning the program and then finding those things that really, really, really bring it off the page. Here's a and great question. That's like a big part in that. The students pour a lot into that part of the process. Here's a great question from one of your friends. <laughs> Why do you choose pieces like Shout for Joy and Oh Praise the Lord by Hale Stork? And I would add into that, have you done Crucifixus by Hale Stork? I have not done Crucifixus by Hale Stork. You've got to do that. It's on my to-do list. Why, why do I do those pieces? Um, I think it's important that... Um, we show that that you know composers of African descent can write in that style um, and and write high caliber music. Um, Hailstock is obviously one of the, the great African American composers. Um, um, you know, his doctorate from uh, University of Michigan and isn't hey, with Nadia Boulanger. Ex exactly, exactly. And it's important for me to highlight to highlight those you know those type those type of songs. Um, um, that's how, that's how I inspire my students at a historically black college and university to, to, to be the next me or to be the next Brandon Boyd, the next Marcus Garrett, Jason Dungey, you know, I could go on and on and on because they, they need to realize, oh, there are people who look like us that do this. Um, so that's, that's very, very important for me. Here's another programming question. In programming different concerts, do you find yourself preparing scores differently? You mentioned that we cannot be experts at everything. Yeah. Do I prepare my scores differently? Um, yes. Um, I, I, I find myself between different genres preparing a different way. Obviously, the way I prepared for Bach will be totally different than the way I prepared for uh, Smile by Cedric Dunn. Um, you know, we, we follow more standard preparation tools. Um, you know, you do your, your map of the song, your phrasing, that sort of thing. Um, with Smile, it may not, it may not take that, you know, knacking like that is a totally different thing. Um, the way I prepare uh, Promised Land would be different. Promised Land is, is something you really want to prepare heavily on text and meaning. Because the entire song is poetry. You want to be sure you, you represent in what was being said. Um, so yeah, my, my pre preparation for, for, for different programs can be different. Progra preparation for different songs can be very different as well. Yes. While you're talking about score analysis, in a sense, or programming, yeah. do you memorize all of your music? Um, you know, Mike, I haven't conducted with a score in front of me for probably decades now. Um, so yes, when I can. If it's a song that we, 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 we just recently got, like, for example, Dale's song that we had to do at ACDA, we, we got up, you know, probably the month before. So something like that, I will use music. But outside of that, I, I like to conduct without scores. I'm just so much, I'm so much more free without it. Okay, um, here's, here's a good one. Um, do you ever talk to your choir about the personal health and how it shapes or affects the sound of the choir? Ooh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, um, I mean, there, there was one year I remember, uh, you know, I, I don't remember why now, but we would take the choir out to the track. <laughs> Just to say, like, you guys need to, <laughs> no, I mean, but yeah, um, health is important. I'm always talking about enough sleep or eating well as best as you can and 
you know, all students hate university cafeterias, but you know, you got to go in there and try and find something balanced um, because it will affect, will affect your personal health and your voice is your instrument. Your instrument is right here. So that's, that's crucial for us. And my, my kids do a pretty good job of, of staying on top of each other with that sort of thing. Great. Um, what tips do you have for recruitment and what do you encourage and discourage? Oh man, I, I, I wish I could answer that question uh, using what better here. Um, understand me when I, when I say this, right? Here at Oakwood, Oakwood is a smaller school and I would love to do more intentional recruiting. Um, recruiting here for the, for the chorus has never been a thing, um, which makes it even more mysterious, right? The kids show up here and they really just can sing. But I would love to be in the position where I could fly places and say, you know what, I, 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 I want you, I want you, I want you, I want you. But I, I'm kind of almost scared to do it now because I don't want to jinx it, you know what I mean? But um, <laughs> um, so, so I, I don't know if I can answer that question fully because I'm, I'm, I'm not in that position or I haven't been placed in that position to, to just go out and recruit. Now, you know, sometimes we go places and I'll say, hey, would you want to come to Oakwood? So it's a, a, a recruiting pitch, but I don't have the, the tools like that to just kind of bring them here. But they, most of the time they come. Oakwood is a Seventh-day Adventist campus, right? Correct. Okay. So that probably also, because of the church, then allows them to have had experience singing in the church as well. Exactly. Exactly. That's a great point, Mike. Exactly. Yeah. Um, here's another here's another question. What else is on your to do list besides crucifixes? fixes? <laughs> oh my gosh! Um, I'm looking around my my office here at the house. I mean, I have I have a stack of music somewhere that's labeled. Um, I forget what I label, but basically a to do list. Or or when I get the right choir, I'm gonna pull it out. Um, but a Aaron Copeland's in the beginning is one that I, I want to do soon. Um, I think I want to want to do Duraflay's Requiem sometime soon. Um, Belshazzar's Feast is on my to-do list. What else? Oh, I, I have so many, just so many pieces. That's an unfair question. <laughs> That's an unfair question. But look, the, the the world is is so filled with absolutely amazing music, and I think as choral conductors, we just need to make the time to find it. Just find it. Um, that's such a rewarding process. And Dr. Shaibi, you, you're a person I've always admired with, with that. You seem to find fresh new music all the time and Bruce Rogers, and I could go on and on and on. It just seems to always be on the cutting edge of finding things to do. So that's an unfair question, but I, I gave you a couple. <laughs> and there's also a whole new generation of composers who are looking for a voice and a, and a platform. and. I think it's important for us to remember that it's you know that we have that opportunity as conductors to yes. represent them and to champion champion them exactly. there's a wonderful question from somebody in orange county i guess we notice that the aeolians sing in mixed formation how do you determine voice placement from year to year ah oh, great question great question um so <clears throat> this is my premise i simply want to put people uh, in the formation where they can comfortably sing. Meaning, um, if one of my singers, if one of my sopranos has a big voice, I'm not going to place her front and center because the entire concert, I'll be going, shh, shh, you're too loud, you're too loud. But if I place them in the back row, they can sing comfortably within the context of the group. So that's my premise. So my softer coloratura sopranos will typically be in the front and the, the bigger voices will be in the back. Um, and then that's just, that's in terms of depth. In terms of width, um, I have this other concept, I call it uh, uh, being a guardian of the gate, meaning, uh, you know, someone who has a ten tendency to be a little pitchy at times, obviously I'm not gonna place them on my ends or my corners because the gate needs to be secure. <laughs> So you place them within and, and different little things like that. Then you started going with colors and, 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 but, but you know what? I, I, we change that all the time. Like I, I probably change formations slightly in some way, maybe every week, um, depending on the song I'm singing or what I need to hear coming back. So, so that varies a whole lot. And that's, that's a science that's always ongoing for me. And I, I think it's important because, you know, it's kind of like an engineer mixing. 
you you want it to sound the way you hear it and and at the same time the singers need to be able to hear what's going on so they could have that uh chamber effect with within themselves what is your approach to working with choirs that are not the aeolians is it different yeah. or about the same as with the aeolians well it uh same I try to do the same principles when I can. You know, your time is limited if you're guest conducting or something, but my principles are pretty much the same. Um, and and because, because I don't know them personally, if, if I have to send repertoire ahead, it, it's, you know, there's some guessing game there in terms of will this music reach their heart? Will they be able to deliver this? And, and, and those sort of questions. So my principles are the same. I go in there, I kind of use my same principles of dynamics. I talk a lot about colors and I try to bring everything the aliens do and just put it in cliff note version because we don't have as, as much time. But um, no, Mike, for me, this past year was probably the most guest conducting I've done in my life. And it's been a lot of fun because you realize quickly what you can spend time on, what you can share and they get it immediately. And, you, and sometimes I share things knowing they won't get it immediately. They could go back to their school choirs and the directors in the room and they could try it. And, that, and that's part of what we do as choral conductors, right? Sharing, hopefully. hopefully. Um, it's no good for me to keep everything I know to myself. And I'm, I'm always talking to colleagues about different techniques and those sort of things. So yeah, I take the same Aeolian concepts that we use and, and that I use and, and implement them when I guest conduct. How has your faith as an Adventist affected your how you perceive music? Oh, wow, that's an excellent question. Um, I'll give, I'll give two ways. Um, it's interesting that I'm doing this now. Uh, a few days ago, I was on a, a friend of mine has a thing he does on Friday nights, a musical thing, and he wanted some guests. So he invited me and I brought along Cedric Dent. I keep mentioning his name, Take Six, a friend of mine out in London, England, Ken Burton, who wrote The Promised Land, Stephen Murphy. And part of my philosophy as being a Seventh-day Adventist, I think because the church started so conservatively years and years ago, the Adventist musicians had to rely heavily on harmony. And harmony, harmony then you have to really listen to tuning. So as a youngster growing up, um, my harmonic ear was really developed at a really young age. And then Take Six came along when I was about eight, nine. And learning their music just taught me a whole vocabulary of chords and that sort of thing. So, so for me, harmony was a big thing. And I think in the Adventist church, him singing, especially in the years gone by, was, a, was, a, was an event. I mean, you can wait for the opening hymn at church to, to, to hear those parts. Things have changed now, the evolution of praise and worship and, and that sort of thing. So one, so musically he's done that. And then I think for myself and our students, because of the faith, um, some of the texts we sing, we feel very, very passionate about. Um, you know, and, and, and I think everyone can find that in whatever you believe, right? Um, you, have to, you have to believe something in order to convince me about what you're singing. Otherwise, why sing it? You know what I mean? It, I could just look at my wall here and, and, and feel just as satisfied if I don't feel anything coming from me. So I think those two things, um, mus musically, harmony, my ear, and then secondly, just my faith, man. I just believe strongly in certain things. We just try to dig in deep and, and, and my students dig in deep as well. But you know, but my choir, we have students who are not Seventh-day Adventists and um, we all find that middle ground of, this is what we believe as a group and this is what we want to convey. So, you know, we, 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 we like to, we don't want to be insular in how we do things as Seventh-day Adventists or not Seventh-day Adventists. That's just who we are. But we try to open up and share with the entire world. We don't, we don't care if you're a Muslim or atheist it doesn't matter to us our responsibility is to sing the message of the music period great um you have found ways to connect with contemporary artists like jacob collier and Doug, donald lawrence what mm -hmm. tips would you give to conductors that want to commission new works and bridge the gap between music of today and the masterworks and differing sounds of each and maintaining the integrity of the choir sound Ooh, that is a deep question um, deep, deep question. In, in the case of Donald Lawrence and, um, and Jacob, um, it wasn't that I commissioned them to do anything. It was more of, um, in Jacob's case, Jacob heard the aliens back in 2013. He came to, this is before he blew up. 
we were in England. He came to an entire Alien concert. And at that point, he was like, this is the most amazing choral experience I've ever had. So when he was writing his, his, his four volume album, I think we're on volume three right now. He always says to me, Jason, whenever I have the chance, I'm going to write something for you guys that will be on my album. So he kind of came from the opposite end. He knew what we sounded like. He knew our orientation with what we like to sing and what we're able to do harmonically. So he wrote for us in that regard. So to answer the other part of the question, which is a really deep question, you know, how would I advise we commission and get new works and new genres? I think that's the question. Um, and still maintain the choral sound. First, I mean, you have to kind of explain to the composer what your instrument is. You know, I have the alien instrument. Someone may have a, a choir that, a different instrument. You have to really explain to them what that instrument is. And then one, right, right to the instrument strengths while still blending the two styles. And it's, it's very intriguing to me now to see composers do now a lot now between themselves. Like I just saw a new piece by Sean Kirshner and Stacey Gibbs. You know what I mean? That's like, that is so funky to me. That is cool because two different orientations coming together to make something new. So same thing. I'm a conductor. Jacob comes to me and I say, Jacob, okay, right here, I think we could do this or maybe change that a little bit. Or Jacob may say, hey, this is what I'm trying to convey from my world. And, you know, just that collaborative energy just always have, has to be there, has to be preserved, has to be uh, challenged sometimes, right? Sometimes I'm like, Jacob, that's not going to work. And I'll get into the studio and it works. So we all good. So um, that's a big question. So I hope, I hope I'm answering it at least a little bit. Um, <laughs> here, here comes another question about new music. You pride yeah. yourself in doing new music. I heard you mention that the 2020 ACDA conference performance was the first time your choristers sang Bach. Yes. For those of us who had exposure to singing major masterworks, etc., I'm curious to know, do you plan on program, introduce your singers to some of the standard choral repertoire from the other periods, i.e. Renaissance? Yeah, yeah, um, always. Um, we, try to, we try to expose them to, to everything here at Oakwood. And, um, you know, it just depends on the season. Um, and, and those of us who teach at historically black colleges and, and universities, I already talked about January, February. There's just a certain, um, certain repertoire we have to do during those months just to keep certain things alive. But definitely, yes, um, one of my, one of my to-do pieces is uh, when David heard uh, that Renaissance setting by, uh, I think it's the, the, it's the Weeks version. Wilkes, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that version has been on my to-do list for a little while. Um, you know, so yeah, I, I wanna expose them to, to everything. Brahms, Motets, Brahms is my favorite guy. Um, you know, so yeah, when we can and the season allows and we have time, we try to put as many things in there so we can expose our students. Because, you know, they, their responsibility too, and especially for my music majors and minors, is to be exposed so that they can then go out and teach and, and continue this choral tradition. So here's one. Do you ever take a break? Yeah. I'm, 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 I'm learning that we, we all have to at some point. Um, otherwise, we just burn out. So yeah, breaks are crucial. And, and the older I get, I'm realizing that more. You know, when I was younger, you just go, 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 go. Now I'm like, oh my gosh. <laughs> so, so yes, you have to take breaks. So here's a question from, um, from Switzerland. Oh, my. Um, what do you do when you don't conduct? Do you have hobbies or other passions besides music, besides basketball probably, right? <laughs> yeah, um, oh yeah, I, I do. Um, so this quarantine time has, has, has kind of brought out some things. Um, kayaking was something I never really uh, thought about. Um, riding a bike is like a big deal now. I just go out ride. Um, reading has always been a big thing for me. Looking at sports, I mentioned basketball, cricket. I'm from Trinidad and Tobago. And I, at, at one point in my life, I was going to be a cricketer. And that's a, that's a true story for another time. Um, in movies, um, Netflix is a thing now. Kind of <laughs> going through Ozark right now. Um, but, you know, just different things. Um, Jacob was another person, Jacob Collier, is so big on, um, I love the way he, 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 he pours himself or dives into other things that seem unrelated to music. And then he, and then he, he finds the correlation. So I remember one time I'm talking to Jacob and he says, Jason, have you read the book, um, how to play tennis? I'm like, what, like, what, are, you, what are you talking about? And he starts talking and all these concepts, but at the end of the day, he brought all those points from over here 
and brought them to music. And I, I love that. Um, just bringing other things from something else in life and nature and, and just bringing it to music. But yes, I, I do have other things I love to do. Here's, I think, the final question we have, and then we can wrap it up a little bit. Um, what, whoops, oh gosh, all of a sudden, here comes three more. Sorry about that. That was, it's fine. That, that's the way it goes. Uh, Carlos uh, asked, what's the most unique way you've heard a colleague describe a vowel shaping? The most unique way I've heard a colleague describe a vowel shaping. Um, I'm not too sure I understand exactly what a person is going for, but um, in term, in, uh, do you have the ability to ask them to rephrase a different way? Sure. Why don't, um, Carlos, will you rephrase that and post it again, and I'll yeah. go to somebody else and come back to it. I want to be sure I'm answering. The yeah. Here is, uh, here is your good friend, Andre, online. Um, George Walker is one of our most distinguished composers. His harmonic language is somewhat challenging. How do you go about helping your singers accept and appreciate that harmonic language? Yeah, I was talking to someone recently about this. Um, how do you go about having students understand different harmonic things? Sometimes you, you have to really analyze the music and figure out a way to, to break it down for them so they, they understand it in their terms or make it, uh, make the lang break the language down in smaller increments. So whether that's just isolating melody line, bass line, and then filling in the harmony, or, or having everyone in the choir singing one line and really, really knowing where everyone is in these chords is, is, is one way that I do it. Um, um, what's another way I, I do? So, so, sometimes, sometimes you really want to take time and balance chords in those uh, sonorities. So, you know, you want to make sure your thirds are not too loud or, or the, the ones and the fives are really nice and locked. And I think people start understanding it a little more. Well, sometimes I'm, you know, I'm not looking at the piece in particular now, but sometimes in pieces like that, you have notes that are missing, right? And you have to fill in the gaps, put the note back in. So they go, oh, I hear what was being implied you take it back out and all of a sudden like they, they get it because now they hear exactly what what's going on so just finding different tools and different tricks sometimes they kind of come amidst rehearsals for me or you go into the process and say you know these guys are not getting it so you have to dig deeper and find a way for them to hear it and which, which Andre was that Mike uh, that was Thomas Andre Thomas <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, just, just finding different ways for these young ears to hear it now. And another way to answer that question is this. These young guys now who play, especially the church musicians and especially the African-American experience, the way they hear chords now is totally different than the way I heard it. I mean, I grew up on take six and I, I know I know a lot of nice chords, but the way they hear stuff and put it together now is like a totally different language, totally different language. So I think it's the same thing finding a way to bring George Walker closer to their ear in a way they could understand it so that we can eventually meet and express George Walker in the way he would have heard it. Here's one. You mentioned you had a team that you sometimes conceptualize programming with. Yeah. Who are some of your favorite conductors regarding programming? Oh, uh, and, and some of my favorite conductors with programming, I may not necessarily talk to them all the time, but I mentioned one already, Eric Nelson. Is a, is a genius, I think, at programming. Uh, Bruce Rogers, my dear friend out in Cali. Um, Dr. Shabi, I've looked at tons of your programs. Um, who else are there? Uh, uh, Charles Bruffy, I like his programming style a, a lot. Um, who else have I been observing a lot? Uh, Jonathan Talberg, I kind of like how he approaches his things. Uh, uh, Georgia State University, uh, uh, Deanna Joseph, Gina Dirt does an excellent job at programming and finding things that push the air or things I really haven't heard before. I'm like, wow, that's, that's new and fresh. Uh, but so, so many names. I hate to start calling names and, and leave someone out who has left an indelible impact on me when it comes to programming. But, um, you know, I just have to kind of look around and, and, and sometimes it's not the popular people. There are people that I don't know about that, that do some wonderful program, programming things and programming that I just absolutely love. So just look far and wide. Um, 
here is Carlos trying to define what he was asking for, okay? Yeah. I guess what I was trying to ask was, um, what is a piece of advice that has stuck with you to get consistent vowel purity? Oh, consistent vowel purity, uh, you know, repetition. Um, you, you, you have to teach that something all the time. Um, and once your choir gets used to this sound as this, they'll, they'll be able to reproduce it, but, but repetition and not less, letting muscle memory kick in. I mean, that's just one of the worst things to, to break, to break. So um, having a choir just really listen across the board. My, my kids laugh at me all the time because I stop rehearsals so many times and I say, how do you guys say that word in America? Because I was born and raised in Trinidad and my vowel orientation sometimes it's just different because of where I'm from. Then you bring people from California, New York, from people from the South, and we say words differently. So just getting them to listen across the board to unify those vowels. You just have to repeat, repeat, repeat. And then warm ups, that's something you can work on a lot. Just unification, unification, unification. Because those those vowels affect so many things. Tuning, how we hear the text, you know, how 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 the chord feels. Um, so that that's a big thing. So repetition. Here's one. Being a basketball fan, mm -hmm. do you use any of the writings of Coach John Wooden in your teaching? I don't. I, I, I should. <laughs> There's some I great should. quotes that he has. I should. Yeah. Take a look at that John Wooden book. Really quite I, something. I will. Um, O'Brien here. With oh, your 10 plus years of conducting the Aeolians, how has your way of teaching evolved between a group of millennial students and a Gen X students? Oh my gosh, that's an excellent question. You know, I, I find myself almost calming down more. Um, my older students are always like, you need, to, you need to be a little more firm, blah, 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 blah. And I think for me, it is the opposite with, with, with the younger students. I think they respond, at least they respond to me more when I appeal to their mind and appeal to the maturity or lack thereof, <laughs> um, as opposed to coming on them really, really hard. And, and you know, another question, I think about my mentor almost every day, Dr. Nathan Carter, and, and he was a stickler and a hard disciplinarian. And I always ask myself, how would he have operated in 2020? And that kind of helps me to think about how I approach my singers. Um, things have to change. I know O'Brien was in kind of like that mid section of my career here at Oakwood. So if O'Brien were to come back now, he would see that um, I probably am a little more patient. Um, we, we, I, I probably try to uh, use different techniques in a more intentional way so that they can really, really learn the rudiments and, and feel comfortable with building their, their skill set and developing their toolkit. Um, so I think, you know, as I mature, my approach changes from year to year. And I, I travel around and I see other teachers doing different things. And I, you know, you borrow them and try to make them your own. But um, the, the millennials think differently. You have to really explain everything to the T for them. Um, you know, if I say, you know, we need to clean this room, um, you know, no, no. If I say clean, clean this corner of the room, Sometimes you mean clean the whole room, but they will literally go just clean that section, leave everything else dirty. And you have to kind of explain everything else. And, and that's cool because they just process the things in a different way. And I guess it keeps me young too, because you have to think like them sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> well, that is all the questions for today. Um, we've gone almost an hour and a half. So um, wow. lots to chew on for us. Yeah. For all of us. Um, I think the pandemic has been uh, a time and I think you were in uh, a reset um, and a time for all of us to rethink. I, I know that my, my box of music to do for next year um, is continually evolving um, as yours is and because so much is unsettled we don't know what we're going to do in terms of space. Um, right. I, I just, uh, here's one last statement. It's uh, from one of our people, and I think it speaks well um, to, to you, um, Jason, for being here. It's a huge thank you from all of us to, to you. Oh, thank wow. you, thank you, thank you. Um, I, I have to say, um, this has been wonderful, and, and I know you well, and I'm just so, so happy to see us have a chance to do this final session with, um, with the chamber singers, and 
and 128 guests. So it's been um, absolutely terrific. I thank um, ITS uh, Florence up there and Micah for their support and helping uh, answer and, and help me with the questions and answers. And I know from all of us at SC and, and all of the conductors here, we're all praying for a, for a return to somewhat normal uh, in September or August. Um, any closing thoughts, Jason? Um. I mean, the fact that all of us are in this virtual room right now, you know, we all believe that art and culture are important in our lives. And um, art and culture is a vehicle to spark conversations, right? To, and to, to spur social change and to make our community strong and healthy and, and probably above all, for me, equitable. And, and we are all aware of the um, classical music, choral music faces this existential threat the audiences are getting smaller and smaller. And I think we need to be very intentional with guarding, guarding this art form. And um, the world needs it, just like we need air, food, and water. We need, we need music. And uh, I just want to leave that with them. And then, you know, I just love staying connected with musicians and especially see what other people are doing, especially the younger, younger ones, because they could teach me so much. So, you know, feel free to connect on social media. Um, it was it J Max Ferdinand on Instagram? Um, People tell me my Facebook is full. I, I, I don't know. I'm sorry. But um, <laughs> J Max Ferdinand on, on Instagram, just join me there and we could, we could sh continue sharing and I could see what you guys are doing. You could see what I'm doing and um, try and keep this art form alive and well. But thank you so much, Dr. Shabi, for having me and the wonderful students. I, I was um, a guest on your wall for the last month and those sessions were absolutely amazing. So I feel humbled to, to be part of this. And for everyone that logged in, wow. Thank you so much. This was great. Thank you all and um, wishing all of us a return to normal in, in the fall. So all the best. Thank you.